Hi, this is Pat Moorhead with More Insights and Strategy, and we're here for another edition, episode 147 of the 6-5 podcast. We are broadcasting from Austin, Texas, not Maui, as you can probably tell. I'm here with my incredible co-host, Daniel Newman. Dan, how you doing, buddy? Doing good, buddy. It, it, I have to say, working in paradise was nice. I, If one more person tries to tell me how they don't feel sorry for me, I'm going to get sad because, frankly, I think working in paradise is kind of torture, especially when you actually work through all the breaks, you work through all the evenings, you work through, um, you know, and then you take red-eye flights uh, home and you feel like crap the next day. But I, I will tell you what, it was a really great event and it's good to be home. Yeah, totally. Uh, I, I have heard, uh, I think I heard once that all – all work and no play makes Jack take an ax and go after uh, his wife in the bathroom in a huge uh, Colorado hotel. I think I heard that once. That's a little dark, but you know, it maybe, is uh, as, dark as, work. The, as dark as the circles under my eyes or, hey, look, uh, or what? You look good. The plastic surgery is panning out. It is. It is. I need to, uh, my, my plastic surgeon and um, all of my doctors are going to get Christmas cards this year. <laughs> so, no, we're back, man. We are on fire. We've got a great show today. We're talking uh, Qualcomm Snapdragon Summit, SAP TechEd, and of course, because Daniel loves earnings, we're hitting NVIDIA and Cisco earnings. Just yeah. kidding. It's great ground truth for all of us, and companies lie less during their earnings. Lie less. I like that. More and more uh, more. we're, we're going to hit tech layoffs and talk a little Twitter and we're going to round out with NVIDIA and Microsoft Azure's brand spanking new supercomputer. So let's dive in. I'm going to call my own number on this one, uh, Qualcomm, um, sorry, Snapdragon Summit. It was incredible. And yes, it is true. Dan, we came in early before everybody showed up. We got set up and we had two hats there. We had not only the analyst hat to be analysts and give good advice and also report back on what we saw. But also the 6.5 was there and we did nine interviews with multiple executives, including uh, CEO Cristiano Amon. We did. Number two in control, Alex Katusian, and many, many more. Links to the show notes, at least on, uh, on one of those. But I mean, where do you start on an event that you pretty much spent uh, the entire uh, week at? So why don't I give it a little bit of context here? So. Qualcomm is a company in transition. It essentially owned, along with um, companies like uh, Facebook and Apple, the mobile transition, right? But right now, uh, sorry, the mobile revolution, but it's really now moving from a phone only to the intelligent edge. And whether that's phone, includes phones, by the way, but incrementally adds PCs, cars, XRs, and the Internet of Things, and not just the uh, human IoT or things like wearables, but also the industrial uh, inter Internet of Things. This show, the Snapdragon Summit, really focused on the next generation uh, smartphone, which was the Snapdragon uh, 8 Gen 2, and also the human IoT that include, included things like uh, XR and also um, wearables and, uh, and and hearables. Uh, it was an incredible show. I mean, um, it, if you recall, we've talked a lot about Qualcomm strategy, uh, pillar number one, with the objective of going after the premium Android, right? Now, it doesn't mean they don't provide uh, a lot of technology and smartphones, uh, smartphone technology to Apple, uh, they do. In fact, uh, Apple uh, exclusively, exclusively uses modems uh, and part of the front end uh, from Qualcomm. But listen, new year, uh, new time to go after uh, to go after those smartphones, and that's that's exactly what the company did with the new platform. I can safely say, uh, particularly based on the increase in performance in AI. I see no reason why Qualcomm can't uh, continue its leadership in, in premium 
uh, Android. And it was really interesting, Daniel, how it's not just AI for AI's sake, but it was about AI to improve experiences, whether that was uh, the radio uh, with the modem uh, to find uh, the best thing to connect to, whether that was the compute camera. Uh, but let's not forget things like Wi-Fi 7, dual Bluetooth, heck, um, freaking ray tracing uh, in, uh, in the graphics uh, as well. I don't think that Qualcomm's gonna win on all the CPU benchmarks, but quite frankly, when, when we look at experiential benchmarks, uh, I don't see anybody uh, anybody touching the company uh, uh, at all. And you know, it is funny, I'm always skeptical when a company says, hey, we're focusing on the experience, because uh, automatically what pops into my head is, oh, it means they're gonna lose in the tech. Well, this is not the case. Uh, what it took, I would say Qualcomm four to five years to really make that transition from doing tech for tech's sake to actually uh, focusing on what people do with uh, uh, with their devices. We've got a little bit of a sneak uh, sneak peek also on the PC side, uh, which was which was really good. We saw Adobe CEO, excuse me, uh, Adobe um, executive in charge of alliances get up and essentially say, they're going to keep adding more native applications to um, uh, the Snap the Snapdragon uh, uh, platform. Um, some people may not know this, but there's already platforms out there. Sorry, already Adobe applications that are 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 native, including uh, including Photoshop. Uh, we saw a brand new XR platform uh, called AR2 Gen One, and I like. I like that a lot, Daniel, because it it really narrows in on the use case of augmented reality with the capabilities to put them in normal size glasses. In fact, the glasses that you have on right now look strikingly similar to the form factor that the uh, AR uh, AR2 Gen 1 was uh, delivered in. You know, it's a one watt part, has uh, three uh, co-processors, uh, has uh, Wi-Fi 7, and most of the compute is coming out of the uh, smartphone uh, itself. And I and I like that model, um, and I think it will likely accelerate uh, what the industry does with, uh, with with AR. And I think the timing is good for when I think Apple is is going to come out. So great show um, started on Sunday. You and I left Wednesday night, uh, both took the red eye back in so we could be in the office for work and plan for this podcast. Yeah, I came home just for this because because I love all of you and uh, you matter in case you forgot. There we go. But, uh, you know, you covered a lot of ground there, Pat. I'll, I'll kind of keep it simple, zoom out and keep us uh, on pace here. But, uh, you know, for, for me, it was really about the future of mobile compute and the implementation and application of AI and everything. And so if you kind of thematically looked across the show, um, a lot of energy was spent on how AI is going to really supercharge this next generation of devices, whether it's, uh, you know, how AI could be implemented to the RF modem system to more intelligently deliver uh, millimeter wave 5G uh, beam forming and making sure you're getting that highest quality signal at any given time. Uh, to the way you can use AI to flex across different levels of connectivity between bands, right? Whether it's Wi-Fi 7, whether it's millimeter wave, sub-6, or a legacy um, connectivity that we need when we're outside of major markets and metros. And then, of course, if you look at uh, XR, if you look at um, mobile compute, uh, the, the PC part of the business, if you look at gaming, you know, everything was, hey, how are we going to take artificial intelligence and layer it to add performance? Can we add intelligence that's going to help save power? Can we add intelligence that's going to help make the device work better? And, th and that to me was kind of like if you went right down the line and just kind of said, how do I streamline and digest what we saw over those two days? That was it. It was that the next generation, the next scale of these companies, products, services, and business is going to be its ability to implement meaningful artificial intelligence on top of high pop, high high performance, some of the lowest power um, system on chip that are available in the market today. 
they got the wins, they've got the partners, they've got Microsoft and Adobe, they've got all the major handset makers, they've got the design wins, they've got the uh, you know Snapdragon Compute uh, in beta with some really large customers. They had Citigroup up on the stage talking about this. These are the pieces and parts that are gonna come together to help build the business. And in our time with Cristiano, you have to acknowledge that this diversification strategy and taking every single device that connects to the network and making it accessible and making it a part of the opportunity, the TAM for Qualcomm is what the company is looking at. And I think they're doing a good job. So I'll leave it there. Um, good event. And it was, you know, as I said, working in paradise. Yeah, probably the, the most interesting thing I think we're both you and I drilled in was on their, their PC uh, potential and I think we're in the same place that we feel pretty confident with the part itself. Um, I mean, you know, e even that's taking us, you know, I think a, a stretch, uh, but uh, unclear uh, on the go to market uh, at this point. So I'm going to be interested to see how that uh, pans out. Um, I'm hoping that they're making a list of what they're not going to do uh, as long as uh, what they're going to do because i think focus is paramount particularly in getting into a new market uh let's dive into another big show this was a uh, sap tech ed um i couldn't attend uh but i did uh watch um the keynote uh virtually when i was slogging it away on the beaches of maui yeah fantastic you know you and i both unfortunately had to uh have members of our team attend, uh, you know, you had Millie Brew, a good article on Forbes, uh, mentioned, uh, you know, some really good good insights, and I'll talk a little bit about that here in a minute. Shelly Kramer, Principal Analyst of Future Research, attended the event live as well on our end. Um, you know, we are very closely aligned with SAP watching the company. This year, the SAP tech ed really zeroed in on one thing, the future of the citizen developer in the developer stack, meaning the citizen developer all the way to the you know traditional software developer and how SAP is really focusing on enabling that particular group to be more successful, to build and run on SAP. And the company actually launched a low code solution called SAP Build. Um, and that whole idea there was to empower the a broader, you know, and, and think about, you know, we've talked a lot about power platform on this show. So SAP is heading more and more aggressively down that path as well. You know, they need to empower people in the, you know, your financial analysts, your supply chain workers, your operations staff, your sales team. How do they build um, system monitoring tools, analytics, uh, process automation, and various applications that will be more successful? And then how do you build this in such a way that you can really support the continuum? Those that are complete novices that really don't know how to do more than email and do Zoom calls, all the way through your highly capable coders that understand, you know, different programming languages um, and are able to develop applications. And all of those, it's about up-leveling and upskilling. So, you know, while effectively SAP Build is a new thing, what they really are doing is taking a group of the different solutions that the company has offered in the past. That Giver, I believe it's Work Zone and one other. Um, and what they're doing is really trying to simplify the product application development life cycle, taking together, uh, you know, compliance, governance, security management of the app development ecosystem and making it more accessible and simpler for more people to do make it more visual, make it more seamless, um, make it serverless uh, using, you know, basically varying tools, data and models to be able to scale up rapidly applications. So, um, you know, a couple of key data points that I, you know, identified was that, you know, there are a number of automation tools that SAP is putting inside of Build to make it easier for users. I believe it's over 130. Um, and this is gonna enable companies to uh, you know, the users, these low coders to be able to build and automate and make sure they're building useful applications that work. Um, there is integrations with Google. There's going to be, um, let me see what else is going to go on here. Um, there's going to be UI development tools. So not only is it the back end of being able to build the 
uh, application to run and also build tools and build visual tools that help applications be seamless and easy. That's always been one of the problems I've seen, Pat, with low code tools is the apps that get developed really look like something that was created in a 10th grade computer science class. So this is an opportunity of something that can be built to make more non-IT folks build apps that are usable, but also that look like they've been developed by real coders. Um, in the end, real coders are low coders, low coders and no coders, that is where the future is heading. But to me, Pat, you know, there was a lot going on at this event, but the SAP build topic was probably the most in focus. And that is all about the fact that we have not enough developers, too many application and data requirements. How do we bridge this gap with people that have the capability to be thoughtful and understand their business and build important applications, make it seamless, make it simple, and keep them on the SAP platform. So there's my tech ed in a, in a quick wrap, you know, wish I could have been there. But for all you out there, this is going to be something important to watch, especially if you're on SAP. Uh, good analysis, Daniel, and a little bit of context in the company itself. It really is a company in transition, right? It's moving. It's a very strong on-prem, uh, some might say legacy player who's moving to cloud, SaaS, and automation. We've seen some incredible success on the cloud side, reasonable success on the SaaS side. And what you're seeing here is really stepping up the automation. You and I have talked for many segments about the software trend of people going to stacks. And SAP has their stack. It's called Business Technology Platform. Uh, it, it takes data and analytics, adds it to AI, application development, automation, integration in one unified environment that looks, smells, and tastes the same. And I think what's unique about this is, first of all, most enterprise Fortune uh, 2000 um, ERPs are based on SAP. So instead of, here's the alternative, which a lot of companies are talking about, is either surrounding your SAP ERP, and that's a lot of what Microsoft is doing, aside from if you have a Dynamics 365 supply chain or ERP solution, uh, or let's say uh, you, you are a... Um, uh, a company like ServiceNow, uh, where it's, hey, let's ETL a giant amount of data and then work on it in some sort of a uh, data warehouse. Well, first of all, ETLing anything is typically expensive because you're copying the data into something else. And secondly, it's not real time. You and I have talked a lot, also a lot, Daniel, about connecting the front end to the back end. That's and, right. Right? So, uh, it's actually an elegant solution from the point that you actually have people who know what they want. Uh, they can drag and drop to click to build an app. It really holds the context of the true data, not necessarily data that's been ETL and and massaged uh, and and moved. Um, and in in a way, if you know, if I were their marketing person, I would be talking about them unleashing the expertise of the business users. Uh, pretty good play. Uh, of course, uh, you know, people can throw stones and say they should have had it uh, uh, a few years ago, but uh, there aren't a ton of people who are exiting uh, SAP for the doors. In fact, uh, most of them are moving to the cloud and I, I see SAP and Oracle trading a lot of punches. Uh, we see every quarter Oracle saying how many Oracle, how many uh, SAP customers it's stolen, and then the next quarter we see SAP talking about all the all the new business they have uh, from from Oracle. It is fun to watch, and we can both agree, Daniel, that uh, the competition is uh, really good. So ho hopefully, uh, you and I can be there next year. You and I are both kind of first in, first out guys. Uh, get the invitations out there and we will likely uh, be there the next time. I can't speak for you, Daniel, because we are different companies. Of course, we are aligned on the 6.5, but very much separate companies. Let's just, wait, wait, what? Anyway. Yeah, <laughs> yeah we, we are, believe it or not. I know people love to like wrangle us in and invite us to the same uh, briefings, but uh, we are very much competitors and, and besties. Let's uh, dive into the next topic, NVIDIA earnings. Kind of a mixed bag here. I mean, if you look at just raw numbers, I mean, they had a slight beat 
on revenue, which I think people were excited about, but they missed EPS by a freaking mile. In fact, uh, they missed by almost 18%. Uh, percent. A lot of product transitions going on here, not only in the data center, but, but also in consumer. They had a ton of overhang in the gaming uh, market, uh, gaming slash crypto market. I'm sure I'm going to get a nasty note about it, but the reality is a lot of people were using their consumer cards to do crypto, even though they disabled some of that function in, in, in firmware. And if I look at the gaming numbers, one, two, three, four, five, I mean, it's the lowest gaming numbers I've seen in two years. They came in at 1.6 billion, uh, took a $700 million pricing adjustment on that old inventory as they work the 4,000 series into the um, lineup. Data center, that looked pretty good. Flattish, uh, year over year was up, and that really was a bright spot. ProViz, uh, like gaming, uh, down the most in two years. And I'm going to attribute that to uh, transition uh, as well. So uh, truly a mixed bag. If I look at the future, uh, what holds them, I think AMD is going to do very well with their new lineup than th that they brought. And I would say for the first time in a long time, they look like more than a threat that they have been over the last two years. Now, I'm going to put an asterisk there. Unless AMD and its graph consumer graphics can muster a much more heightened uh, assault on the marketing front, none of it matters. As you and I have advised and said for years, you have to show up with a great product that delivers a, a meaningful value proposition and have a great marketing uh, back end uh, on that. And I am, um, again, I, I don't think that AMD has invested enough over the past two years to get that marketing muscle. A good example is my son, who's 22, doesn't have any history or recollection of AMD being on top even though AMD and ATI were on top for decades uh, uh, back in the day. Um, and, you know, if you don't have that reputation and you haven't invested in marketing, then you have to show up with a knockout punch with a, uh, with a product. I don't think that AMD has shown up with a knockout punch yet that NVIDIA can't potentially stifle with, um, uh, a card that that sits right at the the high end of of what the company's doing. Yeah, so this was a tough one. I mean, there was multiple sort of warnings and adjustments down that led to this. So when we got what was sort of a mixed bag, I mean, I guess people were relieved that the revenue was above the guide because you know, gosh, after you guide down, if you still miss revenue, that's, that's just <laughs> not a, it's not a good thing. So I think the company was there. I mean, obviously the, the margin and earnings missed. So that's sort of where it was a missed bag, mixed bag. I mean, look, Pat, the gaming area is going to take a while to get the cleanup right. You've got this inventory glut. You had a ton of pricing power. Um, and now you've got a flood in the market. And all the chip companies have had to make some adjustments for this in the last quarter. Those with higher consumer exposure, uh, as well as things like PCs, are going to probably be facing bigger short-term adjustments to figure out how do they get that inventory balanced? How do they get all that inventory out of, out of the system and start shipping again? Why didn't again. AMD have these adjustments, Daniel? <sighs> well, I mean, there's a couple of things when you have... Um, better results is one is you know you have a better handle of your partners and your supply chain you know what's going on b pat i think and, and this is kind of maybe a little provocative but i don't think amd got nearly as tied up in this uh blockchain slash crypto market and ding, so, ding, 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 ding. yeah you know and obviously <laughs> i've been a very bullish on nvidia for a long time and so sometimes you know you have to be able to come back and say what did i get right and what did i get wrong i think what a lot of us got wrong was their gaming business is really good and the company is beloved for its gaming technology, but it wasn't all gaming. <laughs> there was a big chunk of crypto related and the company actually pivoted to that. You know, it had products it was building for 
ETH and, you know, because it saw that as a big market. And I believe in the comments on this earnings, um, Jensen Wong actually said he doesn't see blockchain. The word wasn't crypto, the word was blockchain as being a big part of the company's future. Um, but having said that, you know, crypto has had its booms and busts. So this isn't probably the end, but the reason it might be a little bit of the end is the most stable crypto assets, which are going to be Bitcoin and Ethereum, um, most likely no longer get mined on GPUs. And so one's now proof of stake and one's done on an ASIC. And so the bottom line is, is even if crypto does come back, it probably will never come back in quite the wild speculative nature that was driven by this uh, trillion, multi-trillion dollar pump into the economy from the Fed. And so it's going to come back differently. So that part of the business is going to have to grow more traditionally. A couple positive notes, though. Um, one, automotive had a much better quarter. Um, you know, now automotive, you and I have been critical that it hasn't been capitalizing on opportunities that we've mentioned. Qualcomm has had really robust results. Well, this particular quarter, the automotive business did perform much better. The um, I believe it was just up 86 percent and sequentially 14 percent quarter billion dollars in revenue. Um, a couple of big wins included that Volvo X EX90, where we talked about the LiDAR from Luminar, but it also is powered by NVIDIA. Um, also, Pat, data center is still a solid business. You know, I'm going to stay on my uh, bandwagon right through to the next uh, comment section here about deflationary technology. Automation and AI will be at the epicenter of companies trying to weather what will be a tougher economic climate and being able to implement and apply artificial intelligence to workloads and things like your systems of record, ERP, CRM, business process automation, being able to use large data sets to create uh, multi-turn conversational AI that can replace heavily overemployed call centers. Things like that are gonna be done with AI and NVIDIA is one of the core technologies to this. While, while visualization numbers were down, Metaverse is also part of the future. I mean, Cristiano Amon from Qualcomm actually you know, doubled down in our, in our interview this week about how bullish he is on the Metaverse. The Metaverse will eventually be a thing. The exact iteration of it, where it happens, but the digital twins, the industrial applications for su uh, simulation, uh, autonomy, uh, self-driving, these are the things that will be done in the metaverse. And, and NVIDIA has a large advantage on software to become a really big player in this space. So it's a mixed bag. I'm not, um, I'm not down on NVIDIA. But this gaming thing's got to get cleaned up before we get a real, it's, it's just such a big part of the business before we're going to have real clarity about when they're going to return to meaningful growth. Yeah, you know, NVIDIA just is like a cat, man. It just, you, you think you have them down and they just come back and just get you. Uh, let's dive into the next earning topic that is uh, uh, Cisco uh, earnings. Yeah, let's, I mean, Pat, you know, I'm going to start here where I finished there. Um, I have been on a soapbox for a year now. I was talking to my publicist about this yesterday, and I said, I have been talking about the wait, fact wait, wait, that- Wait, 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 You have a publicist? I do. God, you're- Are we all? Are we all publicists? I am my publicist. Oh, yeah. But you're good at it, by the way. I like um, to, I like to I talk about my favorite topic, and that's me. <laughs> Don't we know? <laughs> I, am just, I am just choking, audience. No, I'm not. Um, <laughs> tweet that, tweet that out. Tweet Pat likes to talk about Pat. Um, you know, and the reason I did this is because you know we we both do TV. You know, you were on CNBC a week or two ago. I do a lot of TV, um, and I do a lot of op eds and things like Market Watch. And my point is, is I've been beating this drum, just beating this drum of hey, you know, boring, stodgy, old tech and companies that focus on things like AI automation. We'll call it deflationary technologies are going to do well as the economy gets tougher, okay? Well, who are these companies? It's gonna be companies that have software for workflow, like ServiceNow. It's gonna be companies that have tools, technology services for automation, like IBM. It's gonna be companies um, you know, that have core infrastructure that keeps your, your ecosystem secure, like Cisco. You know, And these are gonna be the kinds of companies that are gonna be invested in, are gonna be the enterprises, enterprise, technology providers that enable companies to finish the complex digital transformation projects that actually didn't get done during the pandemic. And let me go back and say why I'm saying this, okay? In the beginning of the pandemic, 
people that talked about digital transformation, you know, the yuppie puppeter pundits, you know, that wrote books about it, you know, what clowns, totally. Wow. Anyways, you know, got all oh, we transformed 20 years in in 15 minutes. Those were the comments, right? We just did 20 years of transformation. What did what really happened if you go to Silicon Valley, and we'll talk about this topic next, is companies overhired. They threw bodies at every single problem. You know, revenue grew so fast, demand grew so fast that companies hired more people. They hired sales, they hired marketing, they hired product, they hired warehouse workers, they hired whatever it took to basically deliver on surging demand, they hired. And yes, there were some technology implementations that took place, but actually think about like the Zoom bombing problem. A lot of security uh, problems popped up early on in the pandemic because companies threw so much at growth that they actually didn't shore up their fences or they didn't automate processes. They hired thousands more people in call centers or they didn't automate warehouses. They put more bodies in warehouses than they needed so they could get stuff shipped out the door. So the idea that all this automation took place was actually sort of human backed with a with a good story that pundits could tell about how this stuff could work in the future. Maybe someone should write a book. We'll call it Human Machine. And we'll talk about how all this stuff goes together. Maybe someday. Long story short, God, man. Um, and I realize I've gone down a way tangential to Cisco earnings, but you know what? You don't need me to read the results. Cisco's results were really good. And so what I've been kind of down this path of saying is that, you know, companies that are in this steady enterprise backing technology state are going to actually have solid, robust results. So Cisco's revenue up year over year. Cisco's earnings up year over year. Cisco's guidance up year over year. This is really good stuff. So overall, you know, the company has been focusing on software revenue growth, which they've done. They've been focusing on ARR growth, in which they've done. Now, these aren't staggering 20 and 30 and 40 percent growth. This is steady state, 5, 10 percent growth in a very difficult FX world, in a difficult macroeconomic situation because Cisco offers security, offers tools for data management, offers the hardware people need to run their businesses and actually finish these digital transformation projects. I know we got more to talk about. I could go on a while. I wasted my time on my soapbox here. I'll let you take this one home. I don't know. I mean, your your ratio of uh, plugging your books uh, as a percentage of minutes talking was was extraordinary. <laughs> I loved it. I learned from you, buddy. I, really? I learned it all from you. Dang it. Then who did we learn it from? I don't know. I don't know. I just read one of your books. No, I mean, listen. Beat on the top line, beat on the bottom, and they raised guidance. Mic drop. No, no, I mean, I I was incredibly bullish after I left their uh, partner conference. And I got to deal with, I got to meet with pretty much their entire C-suite. Uh, Chuck, CF, I mean, all the product leaders, CFO. And so I'm, I'm pretty, pretty high on the company right now. I mean, they had records everywhere. Largest quarterly record, uh, largest quarterly revenue, second highest quarterly EPS in the history of of the company. Pretty much grew in network security and applications. Cat nine K, Cisco eight K, Meraki Wireless Thousand Eyes Duo. Not hearing a lot of talk about uh, WebEx in there, but then again, we're not at the uh, we're not at peak uh, COVID. RPO, thirty one billion, right? I freaking love that. That's sixteen billion over uh, the RPO that they expect over the last uh, twelve uh, months. And yeah, single digit increases. I totally, totally get it. It's not like some of the uh, the growth engines that, uh, that 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 we lean on. So, um, but I like to see anything compared to them. You know, the company's Daniel is really in a in an interesting spot. I feel like it has differentiated itself uh, from the HPEs, the Dell Technologies of the world, but it doesn't have that cachet of let's say the the Microsofts and the and the AWS and, and and the Googles of the world. So it's in this really interesting position. And I could see with all the the uh, real estate pundits, sorry, the um, tech uh, investor pundits out there, hey, who do we compare them? Who do we compare them to? Right? I could totally see that being 
uh, uh, being 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 a, a challenge. But you know, w- when I look at what they said they were going to do, what they did, and then look at RPOs, I feel like this train is going to continue going down the road. But let me reiterate. The show is for informational and educational purposes only. We might talk about public companies and their earnings, but please don't take anything that I say or Daniel says or infers for investment advice. Deal. Daniel, let's move to tech layoffs and a little sprinkling of Twitter. This has been a lot of fun. It's been depressing for some. Listen, I've been I've been laid off so many times, Daniel, I can't even tell you every time I bounce back, baby, to something better. Have you really? Oh, yeah. All right. It's been people getting out of businesses and AMD was down to six months cash. They pretty much got rid of anybody who wasn't in engineering or or in sales. And I was in neither. This one's yours, buddy. You can start. Oh, my gosh. You got to be kidding me. It's me. I was totally punting this uh, over to you. So, first of all, we've seen layoffs from Meta, Twitter, Amazon, Lyft, Stripe, Salesforce, Microsoft, Robinhood, Coinbase, Cisco, a lot of different companies. And instead of focusing in on the numbers and the companies, I want to talk holistically about economies and how this works. So, um, Dan, I know you like to play virtual economist, and I think you're really good at it. I love, I'm a student of history. And essentially we have different cycles that have happened over the last hundred years and they are boom and bust cycles. Rarely is there a stasis of GDP and inflation and and interest rates. We have an incredibly high interest rates compared to where they were when there was literally the, uh, the Fed was was loaning at 0%. That's free money. Banks might put two or three points on it, but essentially it was three free money. And what happens is you are able to go and get a lot of debt. And that included a lot of tech companies who were making some very good, but some very uh, bad uh, investments out there. And here we are in the state of economy. So Don't be surprised. I think what's surprising people is this is some of the first time that any of these companies is doing layoffs, companies like Amazon, right? Who's been on this uh, rocket ship. You made a very good point about uh, automation, Daniel, which was people just, you know, when it came to things like production and warehouses, just hire bodies and get them in there. Very little investment in automation like robotics or software automation like we talked about uh, earlier with the build product from from SAP. Uh, But uh, I think that people will look at this, companies will look at this time to get lean, quite frankly, get rid of some of the C and the D players that were hired. I mean... Some companies hired 100,000 workers over the last decade and hard to keep people. And I guarantee you that there were some very bad hires uh, along the way. So this is a good time to get focused on what matters, cut out uh, what, what doesn't. That's my thoughts on the tech layoffs. All right. So... How much time do we have? We have one more topic, probably a quick one though. 11 minutes. I'm going to use the majority of our time on this because the last topic I think is more of a bit of an update. Um, Okay. The layoffs themselves are almost entirely a byproduct of what I, what I said in that last segment. And that's that companies through relentlessly through bodies of things. And by the way, paid extraordinary prices to hire people during the labor tightening cycle that we just went through. But because growth was, be felt to be or seemingly endless. Um, ZERP with zero interest rates made you know liquidity very easy for companies. They could kind of go all in. And of course, all-time record high stock prices gave the market a lot of confidence to continue forward and, and companies continue forward. We've seen that completely get slashed now. A miss on earnings, you may as well set your business on fire right now. A um, you know, the labor market is still tight and pricing hasn't necessarily come down, but you still have to grow and you have to grow earnings too. And that's not, there's no um, 
patience in the marketplace right now. CEOs are under fire. Mark Zuckerberg basically said, we're going to stay flat. And then the market was like, no, you're not. And they sold the stock. They were going to sell them down to 50 bucks a share. I mean, 90, he would have gone down 90% from the highs had he not basically made those layoffs. Companies want to see, sorry, investors, the market wants to see companies doing what it's going to take to put themselves in a position to survive this period of time. Period, 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 period. So that's where we're at with layoffs. Can I use a segment? I'm just going to pivot. I want to talk about Twitter, though, really quick. Yeah, baby. R- okay. Roll it up, dude. I, Let, I let's hear it. To preach, talk about preach. Twitter. Okay. This isn't a bitch fest. This is just going to be an observation. It may or may not be popular, but I'm extraordinarily tired of people that have never built a company of 1, 10, 100, 1,000 people thinking that Elon Musk should somehow put on a Superman cape and be able to reverse over a decade of really poor management, poor product management poor monetization, poor uh, customer service and treatment, poor innovation, and just turn it around. And everybody's just absolutely bombing the guy. Now, look, did he make some mistakes? Should he weighed in on the Pelosi thing? Probably not. Um, but you know what? He's an iconoclast. <laughs> he, has, he has built a right through creating from scratch trillion-dollar companies, from putting everything on the line in his career to be able to you know, have an opinion. And sometimes his opinions are going to be wrong. I also want to know when we got to a zero inaccurate, zero wrong, zero uh, world where people can't ever say anything wrong. I just want to know when that happened. Somewhere along the lines, we lost the ability to have real discourse in public or even throw out a possibility of something being wrong. And things like COVID and things like policy and politics, we have learned now that people had said things correctly, been filtered out, blocked, and um, deplatformed for things that later turned out to be true. So there's a lot of problems right now with this. He basically bought a company that is not only in transition, but a company that was in an absolute disaster. And I love Twitter. So this is not like me putting on Twitter hate. And he was asked, like I said, within what, 48 hours to make it hum? The privatization of this company is going to be the best chance of it to have a chance to reboot, recreate its culture. People that don't want to d- to double down right now while this company is underwater, you know, his whole memo thing, look, you could say hardcore, you could say hard work, but the culture of that company was like no work. Nobody worked. There was too many people and nothing worked. Whether it's the, the software bloat in microservices and just all the poor architecture and design that he's trying to unravel right now, or it was the complete lack of a strategy to monetize the platform successfully for over a decade now all needs to be reflected upon. Now, look, I'm not an apologist for Musk. I'm just saying nobody can turn around a $44 billion company um, inside of, what, 10 days and expect to be really successful. And if it was anyone but him, I think people would have a more reasonable outlook and expectation for how quickly this should happen. But I would say give it three, maximum six months and come back with an opinion then. If you have an opinion at that point and it's still as bad of a disaster as it was the day he got it, then you know what? Shame on him. But I think for all of those kind of armchair quarterbacks out there that have never built anything, it might be a moment to reflect a little bit upon why you're so angry about this and maybe give the guy a CEO that has built a trillion dollar market cap company from scratch before and say, let's give him a little bit of time to see if maybe he can pull this together and make Twitter better than it was because it couldn't have been much worse. Yeah, I mean, let's just, I mean, I don't I think people don't like Musk primarily because of his uh, political affinities and he kind of moves. He's kind of like a a center. I mean, sometimes he's he's conservative and sometimes he's liberal. So I don't think people like that. I think uh, all the liberals want him to be liberal all the time. And I think many of the conservatives want him to be a Republican all the time. I, I think I think that's what it is. Uh, you know, with regards to the memo, I, I tweeted it out today. I received two of those memos from senior management. One of them was from a huge company and one of them was from a startup. And uh, I pressed the yes button and I got promoted and I got super experience and ended up turning at least one of the companies around uh, that, that I said yes to. So um, I, I, I kind of like the uh, sign up or get out and every company I've worked for, I guess, except my own, uh, I've seen that memo. Anyways, I like it. And the great thing is, this is a free country and you don't have to like it if you don't want to. Let's hit the next one. Daniel, take us <laughs> home. 
NVIDIA and Azure supercomputer in the cloud? Well, you know, this was supercompute week. Um, and, you know, we, we talked a lot about NVIDIA and earnings, but, you know, it never hurts in this particular area, the area Satya and Adela to, to announce a partnership. We watched multiples of these at Snapdragon Summit this week. You know, the company is, is basically looking as Microsoft is set to be the first public cloud that's going to take the entire NVIDIA stack uh, of a GPU network and AI software to offer a supercomputing instance. Uh, uh, you know, it, to me, Pat, it's pretty early days. I mean, I'm, you know, just kind of reading about this because we weren't there. I wasn't on this announcement, but it seems to me that this is a, a you know, it's a big win for NVIDIA to be on Azure's platform and to get the full buy-in across the, the stack. And to me, for Microsoft, this is tapping into a powerful combination and doing a little bit like what we've seen with Quantum. You know, these kinds of workloads are gonna be migrated into the public cloud to make them democratized and make them more accessible to people. And there's not a name that, you know, if you look at the ML Perf results and some of the data that's come out, NVIDIA has clearly been leading for quite some time. And I think Microsoft's looking for ways to diversify, bring more data and workloads into the Azure ecosystem. And this is an interesting partnership. And, you know, since we only have a couple of minutes, I'm not going to, you know, say too much more because I haven't had a chance to fully dive into it, Pat. But, uh, you know, I think that, that, you know, this is a timely partnership. It's a great way for, you know, a, uh, Azure to go out and sell more to this high performance computing ecosystem and scale up that particular business. And it's good for NVIDIA to continue to lean in to this market, which is going to be much more robust right now in this current ecosystem than some of the more consumer led parts of its, its business. So early days, don't have a ton yet to add on this one, going to spend some time. But uh, it, I, I, I think this is going to be the way we're going to see a lot of these kinds of high-performance workloads adopted in the future is going to be through um, instances launched on public cloud. Yeah, and if you uh, want to see more about Supercomputing 22, uh, we shot some 6.5 videos uh, with Dell and also check out some stuff from uh, HPE uh, as, uh, as well. Uh, you know, Daniel, um, there are companies like Grok, and even uh, Habana, and we'll see with Tranium coming up here at AWS reInvent, that I do believe have a have a uh, potential here. And I think the market does need more competition, particularly on the training side. Really, it has become a, a competition between software ecosystems. Now, year after year, I'm seeing the cloud guys either try to disintegrate um, or dis, uh, you know, find a disintermediation layer between it and NVIDIA, or find ways to leverage uh, CUDA uh, using other people's hardware like AMD's. But it is a fascinating spot, and it is completely amazing how long um, NVIDIA has been in the top spot. Dan, this has been a great show. Um, boy, we love to go long, and we love to talk and listen to ourselves talk and sometimes even stroke ourselves. Uh, but we are going to be back. Uh, we're going to be back on the 6.5 uh, in two weeks. So we're going to be uh, landing at uh, reInvent, have a lot of good stuff, a lot of good content, and uh, interviewing with uh, senior executives. But check out uh, the stuff that we did at Qualcomm Snapdragon Summit. You can find that in the show notes. We did nine videos. Uh, talking uh, tech with all the executives here. I learned a lot. I think you can too. So so for this week's episode, you want to put something in there, Dan? No, I was just going to say, you know, next week with the holiday, we may or may not uh, be jumping back on. There are a couple of big earnings, Dell and HP and a couple others. So maybe you and I, if time permits, we'll do a quick special ed for everybody. But if we don't see it before the holidays, I just want to wish all of you in America or that celebrate the Thanksgiving holiday, a wonderful Thanksgiving. I appreciate you adding that, Daniel. Uh, you always tend to bring the human part because you're just that kind of guy and, and you're a millennial. I'm a little hardened in my old age here, uh, but uh, somebody has to do it. There's always going to be a new young person who's going to knock us off, Dan. Always no way, buddy. That, my friend. Let's, uh, let's take the world over, my friend. Uh, we can, at least for this decade. Everybody, thanks so much. Uh, we appreciate you. You know where to find us on Twitter and LinkedIn for as long as LinkedIn is up. Uh, no, I haven't moved a Mastodon yet. 
but apparently uh, somebody was spoofing Daniel on on Mastodon, which was I think they were weird. just uh, just I think what ended up it wasn't a spoof. I think they were syndicating my feed. <laughs> ah, very cool. So, uh, anyways, thanks everybody for tuning in. We really care about you. Take care. Talk to you next week. Bye.